Welcome to this next video on the major schools of ancient philosophy. Now, all the ancient schools of philosophy started from this man here, Socrates. And Socrates had two, a student who had another student, and these became known as the Big Three. And so Socrates' pupil was Plato, and, and Plato taught Aristotle, and Aristotle eventually taught Alexander the Great. But Alexander the Great doesn't really count because he's not a philosopher. So the big three are Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Now, Plato and Aristotle are mutually, um, kind of mutually exclusive, but they don't contradict one another. They just complement one another. Their systems, their systems, their two systems, Plato up here on the top half and Aristotle down here on the bottom half, are more differences in emphasis or focus and interest than they are contradictions of one another. In fact, the two schools harmonize quite well if for anyone who is who wants to do so. So first off on top here, Plato here always had his head up in the clouds. Plato is what we call an idealist, anyone who's always looking up into concepts and ideas symbolized by clouds, in a way, because, you know, heaven and, and, you know, ideas are ethereal, just the way clouds are, and, you know, concepts are up there in, in the heavens, um, where the mind goes after it dies. So, plate, so anything above on the top half here would be called ideal, whereas anything down in the bottom half here would be called real. So Aristotle is a realist, but Plato is an idealist. And the, that, dif that difference between idealism versus realism will play out through all the histor history of philosophy. Pretty much every philosopher, except maybe Kant, and maybe Thomas Aquinas, can be classified as one or the other. Okay, so... Um, Platonism always focused on what he called the forms, and you can see this little dashed chair here. Plato would look at a chair and say, ah, but that's just an illusion. Um, the real things that exist are ideas, concepts, because after all, we can abstract away from a chair. We can abstract away from its color, and then it would be black and white. And then we can abstract away from its actual substance, and it would just be like a virtual outline on a virtual reality simulation. And then we can even uh, abstract away from its shape, take away the, sh the, the, sh the chair shape, and you're left with just a an idea of a machine designed or a contraption or an object designed to substitute for your legs and will so that you can stay upright even without using your legs. So that might be a definition of chair, an ideal definition. Um, it's not a perfect definition, but it suffices. So Plato said that um, you can abstract away from anything in the world. Bingo! May the world must not exist as we see it. It's all an illusion. And if you watched our little story about his allegory of the cave, he considered this whole world that we see basically as like the people tied up inside the cave. And they only will start to see reality and come out and see the sun when they put their head up in the clouds and start to think of the pure ideas, the pure concepts. And Plato came up with a special word for these, and he called them the forms. The form of chairness, the form of justice, the form of um, your best friend. <laughs> not that not your actual best friend, but just the form or the, their principle or their essence or their character. Okay, so Plato is through all his wrote all these books of philosophy, and the main one here is the Republic. He also wrote many dialogues and he also wrote a excuse me and wrote a report of how Socrates' life and, more importantly, death. But Plato's main book here was The Republic. And in that book, as, and also 
down here in um, Aristotle's Ethics, but also it's all throughout Aristotle, um, there appears this three-step system here um, for classifying the world. And this is how we know that Plato and Aristotle agree, because they both come to this three-step system. Plato in his Republic, Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics. So um, this system represents human nature. You are vegetable, animal, and rational. There are three parts of you. Your vegetable part is your body. Your animal part is your nervous system and also your endocrine system. Nowadays, we would say also. Back then, just your nervous system. And your rational part is, your, is the part of you that is purely immaterial, purely spiritual, that will survive death. And you could call it your spirit, but you can, you can divide that spirit up into your intellect, downward tending, and will, upward tending. So, um, having the system here is then very, very useful. Um, we will see it recur all throughout history of philosophy. In fact, modern psychology just bingo rediscovered it. <laughs> A guy named Piaget and another one named Kohlberg rediscovered this system using empirical um, evidence from studying child development. And lo and behold, they came to the exact same model. They didn't realize it, but they had really just reinvented the old wheel of Plato, the old pyramid of Plato and Aristotle. Okay, so Plato and Aristotle were mutually exclusive. Plato was focusing on the forms up here in the clouds, and but Aristotle had his head buried in the sand and wanted to study nature. And so Aristotle studied natures. Now what is a nature? Well for Aristotle, the nature is the same thing as a form, but instead of being up in the clouds, Aristotle said, no, the nature is built into each thing. It's actually inside the physical object. Now, Aristotle didn't know about, like, DNA, but that would be a good representation of what he was talking about when he would say the nature of, thing, of a thing. It's kind of like the seed or the code that makes that thing grow and become what it is in the real physical world. All right, so Aristotle kind of um, brought Plato back down to earth. Um, you can see he wrote the physics and a lot of biological treatises, but he also did platonic kinds of things like the metaphysics and the ethics. So really these two are not so radically separated but they mutually mutually um, just focus on different parts of the pyramid. All right, um, now this middle layer here is the animal or the sensate level. And um, this, how, the, how you regard this middle layer is going to determine what school of philosophy you fall into. And I'm talking about Plato and Aristotle's offspring. They're philosoph the people who came from them. So there are four schools that came from Plato and Aristotle. And two of the schools on the left here kind of ignored that middle layer. They um, wanted to focus on essentials, whereas the middle layer is kind of where you focus on incidentals or the real the philosophical term for incidentals is actually accidentals. Same thing, means the same thing, accidental and incidental, but um, if you want to be philosophical and use the correct terminology. Um, some schools focus on accidentals, which are things that are changing in the world, things that constantly um, come and go. You know, this is just what your senses are made to deal with. You know, someone of a bright color, a deep smell, a awesome imagination. All these are accidentals. They're changing. They're transient. They don't stay. So the schools on the right here in yellowish color are, in this, in this on the right I should just say, are 
focusing on accidentals at this middle layer. The schools on the left focus on essentials. And there, there are two versions of, the, of essentials that you can focus on. Because you can either, fo either focus on essentials up in the clouds, like Plato, namely this top layer. You know, the top layer is essential. It doesn't change. And the reason it doesn't change is because it's on top. There's nothing above it to, like, flow down into it and make it mess with it. So there's really nothing to trump ideas. Ideas stay forever and ever and ever. So if you focus on ideas as essential, then you're going to fall into this school called Stoicism. And many of the um, Platonists became Stoics. However, if you think that what is actually essential in life is the physical world down here, this lower layer, then you'll fall into cynicism. And many of Plato and Aristotle's um, students became cynics. So that's basically the division. You can either focus on essentials on the left and then be stuck in the two outer layers, or you can focus on accidentals and focus on the middle layer and say, hey, that's where it's at, at the center. Or you can say, no, that's where it's at, at the, at the top or at the bottom. So that's the way um, the big three here, how their schools splintered up. And it's a perfectly natural thing to do because, you know, we can expect that these schools would have occurred even if it hadn't been with the same people or the same names. Because really what they're just doing is dividing up the natural, um, the, the, natu their I the natural ideas into either essential or incidental and spiritual above or physical below. Okay, see this dot, this dashed line in the center? There was also a similar line here. In fact, I'll bring it to the front here. Um, this dashed line separates the spiritual above from the, I guess it's not dashed here, I'll make it dashed. Um, separates this, oh I can't, okay. Separates the spiritual above from the f physical below, or the material, you might say, below. Okay, so, um, what about this middle layer then? This middle layer is a doozy, um, because it's transient, it's always changing. It contains your senses and your nervous system, which are always changing, and your imagination, like your instinct. And so, actually, I'm going to take that out, and I'm going to but you'll remember, I'll just leave it here on the side so you remember. And here's a better way to just show that middle layer. So here we have your, there are two things ca called the external senses, which is your motor faculty, you use your muscles. And the, ex that's half of the external senses, and we're, they're called senses because you kind of feel your muscles as you use them. But the main external senses are the, seven senses that we're familiar with. Sight, sound, touch, taste, actually there's five, I'm sorry. Taste, touch, sound, smell, whatever, all those. So normally when people speak of senses, what they're really talking about is the external senses. But there are also two senses here that most people aren't aware of, and these are called what ancient philosophers called the internal senses. Um, kind of the External because it's out near the external world, is oriented and toward the external world. See how the senses are looking out into or listening out from the external world. But the internal senses focus in on the internal world of your mind. You can see imagination here kind of looking up into the concepts, the world of concepts. Our imagination is an attempt to represent in some way those concepts in a way that our sensate senses can deal with it. So we might think of imagination as brain functioning, because that's where it works. Imagination is brain waves in the brain. And we might say, think of instinct, instinct as the spinal column. So you can see my spinal column here, because instinct is just like reaction. It's where a principle of our body just instantly reacts. So, um, and it, you can see the nerves coming off of it. It spots, often spawns motor action, but not always. Okay, so really we can say that these two accidental schools over here, namely sophistry and epicureanism, 
are really just focusing on the two halves, the top half and the bottom half of this middle layer. So sophistry is really focusing on cultivating your imagination and your instinct, whereas Epicureanism is really focusing on cultivating your motor faculty and your, more importantly, even your senses. So that's another way that you can divide it up. Instead of dividing it up into essential accidental and spiritual versus physical, you could just divide it up as top layer, top half of the middle layer, bottom half of the middle layer, and bottom layer. So that's the way it goes. Um, Stoics, um, sophists, epicureans, and cynics. All right, so let's, let's take a look at these schools. The first school to really emerge, well, actually the first school all along was the sophists, and Plato gave the sophists a bad name. These were people who wanted to use their philosophy to make a buck by educating the, um, the kids of politicians. So they would go around from town to town and show off their skill in making people who think they knew stuff um, suddenly realize that they were wrong. So these sophists kind of became annoying in a lot of ways. And the sophists didn't really care. Plato's great criticism of them, and actually Socrates's criticism, is they didn't really care about the true values, the true forms, the true ideas. They didn't care about right and wrong. They didn't care about justice and injustice. All they really cared about was what was expedient for them to make themselves look good, look smart, and get some money. And so, these, so the, this phrase here, to represent the sophists, to represent their attitude, their philosophical attitude, was that man is the measure of all things. So if you please a man, then that's all, the best you can do. That's what matters in life. They were yes men. They were, um, you know, go along, get along, wheelers and dealers, savvy, um, savvy people. But Socrates said, no, you should focus on right and wrong. So, um, Sophists kind of disappear as a school as these other schools that really came more from Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates emerge and kind of make the sophists look bad and look ashamed. And so sophistry kind of dies out. The next school to come from Plato and Aristotle is cynicism. It's from the Greek word kune, which means a dog. So you could kind of say that Cynicism is dogism. And these cynics were not ashamed to pretend that they were dogs. <laughs> they said, yeah, that's a good, apt description of us. They were rebels to social conventions, kind of like um, hippies out in the um, you know, free love, free drugs movement in the 1960s. Rebels to manners, to expectations of what's right even against even rebels to law to the law um, but the thing was they didn't have anything so you couldn't scare them you couldn't do anything to make them do what you wanted to do and here's an example of the first cynic um, student of Plato and his name was Diogenes and you see the dogs sitting here, because um, this is probably how the cynics got the name for dog. They were always living amongst the dogs. Diogenes would live here in a pot. He had no possessions, except a loincloth. But he's a, he is here draw, sh drawn here showing a lamp, because Diogenes would go through town holding up a lamp in broad daylight, saying that he was looking for an honest man trying to find an honest man, someone who is truthful and not swayed by peer pressure and respect for persons and just someone who was honest. And cynics, the cynics like Plato, like Diogenes, I'm sorry, like Diogenes, um, were rough. They were rough people. Okay, actually, why don't I uncover his name here? 
um, they didn't, they said they were not citizens of their local city, like all the other Greeks were proud to say. No, they said, we are citizens of the cosmos, hence we get the word cosmopolitan. And so one day, the story is that Alexander the Great came along and found Diogenes sitting there, and Alexander the Great actually greatly admired Diogenes and said, if I wasn't Alexander the Great, I would follow the life of Diogenes. So Alexander said to Diogenes, hey, you've really inspired me. What can I give to you? What can I do for you? And Diogenes here, who is not a respecter of persons and doesn't care anything, a wit for a king, said, stand out of my son. In other words, <laughs> Aristotle... I'm sorry, in other words, Alexander was no better than sunlight to Diogenes. <laughs> so, um, any case, um, Diogenes was described by Plato as Socrates gone mad. He certainly had the same ideas as Socrates to challenge the world, but he was going to challenge everything. Socrates at least would wear a toga and interact in the a political life, and Socrates had even been a soldier. Diogenes wasn't going to have any of it. Um, he was a cosmopolitan, a citizen of the cosmos. So cynics got to be regarded as the, the bilge water, the riffraff, the scum of society. They would come into the marketplace and start preaching uh, against all these conventions and traditions and polite societies and they would make themselves you know, they, they were tough first of all because they had to survive on pretty much just lentils but then they were also since they were no respecters of persons you couldn't stop them they were just there to be an annoyance to you know the merchants to the politicians to the priests to everyone and so um, they were start, people started treating them badly and would like throw them bones just like dogs. And the cynics would play along and say, yeah, we're dogs, ha <laughs> ha. And the story is one day, well, I won't go into that story, it's a little gross. Um, but they acted like dogs, we'll say. But a lot of people didn't like this. And the story is that one day, one cynic named, or a student of the cynics named Zeno, came along and saw his um, teacher, who, who was named, I think, Critias? Um, no, it's some other name. It starts with a C, but I don't remember it. And found him there making love to a woman, because she was also a cynic, right in plain sight. And, and, it, and Zeno here, in his horror, ripped off his cloak, and thereby made himself naked, but covered them two up, and said, ah, oh, this is not the way to go. And Zeno started a new school of philosophy called Stoicism. Stoicism was radical, just like said the cynics, but instead of focusing on being a rebel to the whole world by saying that all that matters in life is this physical realm, the Stoics said, no, what matters in life is back to Plato, back to those ideas. So, um, so along came Zeno here and started preaching instead of, you know, bitter life and just toughness, started preaching virtue. So not, not physical toughness, but mental toughness, spiritual toughness. So the Stoics would actually become, therefore, very much loved by the upper classes, by the politicians, the merchants, the priests, and many of them would become Stoics. In fact, even here, Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor. He was a Stoic. Seneca here, who is, who is this guy, was a counselor to Nero. Cicero was a Roman senator and consul, mainly, namely the, a, a person who ruled the whole Repu Roman Republic. So Stoicism had everything that cynicism had in its um, toughness, 
but it did it in a way that was acceptable to society. And so these Stoics here um, came to really become the backbone of the ancient world's um, leaders. Um, the theme of Stoicism is that things may go wrong. You may be in great pain. You may lose all your possessions in life. You may lose your friends. You may lose everything. It doesn't matter. You can still be good and happy without it because all those extras, even your own life, are not essential to you, they said. The only thing that is essential to you that you can control is your virtue. So that's what they preached. In fact, Marcus Aurelius here um, wrote a great work called The Meditations, in which, which he wrote while he was going off to battle on the cold frontiers while his whole army was suffering from disease. And he would just write this things like this over and over to himself. The, 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 world, the ancient world, the world may end tomorrow, but do not fear, just focus on yourself and perform your duty, your, your duty heroically, what you can do. Um, and many of these Stoics, actually, like Cicero here, even actually came to believe in an afterlife because they saw the, the whole universe as on fire with a concept of Plato called the Logos, the, or, or the Word, which is kind of like the programming for the whole, whole universe. Um, they said that all these ideas, these forms of Plato, were, were tied into one great Logos, one great Word, or um, program, or even... Um, concept or and so many of them if you'll read if you happen to do the work on um, the dream of Scipio which was written by this guy Cicero you'll see that idea of, of the burning logos that is in the cosmos and that we are all destined to return to it someday so these were actually these people were actually really moral people you have Zeno, Cicero, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, and then Epictetus was another Stoic philosopher who was very famous in Roman times. I should have actually put him at the end, or actually in between there. Okay, so Stoicism was focusing on the spirit, whereas Cynicism was focusing on the physical. Um, but these two schools were kind of at the extremes. And it wasn't really good for the common person. It wasn't, I mean, if you were educated and taught these ideas, that would be great. But a lot of people, the vast majority of people in the ancient world couldn't pay for education and didn't know anything about this. So the last school to merge here actually appeared to the common people. And it was called Epicureanism. And it was founded by this guy, Epicurus. And you see him here sitting on his pile of atoms, because he said that the whole world is just a big pile of atoms. And when you die, your spirit, ever since everything is physical, including your spirit, he said that your spirit would just evaporate into the air like a mist. And so, you know, when you die, that's it. You're just going to evaporate into the air and there you will be no more and that was Epicurus here and you might think well gee Epicurus that's depressing why should I um, <laughs> believe in your philosophy but Epicurus said hey 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 but it's okay there actually are good things in the world because Epicurus wanted to focus on this middle layer and since he was physical focused he was actually focused more on the senses than on the imagination so Epicurus said, well, what's good in life is the simple pleasures. You know, you can enjoy your senses. Open up your eyes. Look out into the world. Go find those good-tasting ta good foods. Um, but Epicurus was smart, and he realized that if you actually indulge in these things, like food and drink and sex and beautiful 
aromas, then it's going to, you're actually going to injure yourself and hurt yourself and, you know, addict yourself and then you won't be enjoying it. So Epicurus said, well, put the brakes on and don't dive into it all the way, just enjoy it moderately. So Epicurus preached moderate enjoyment and you were supposed to drive a certain blessedness, a certain moderate blessedness from the simple pleasures in life. It was kind of like um, a lot of old-fashioned, you know, Amish um, type philosophy. And he said, what you should try to do is avoid upset, avoid tumult, because that's what, um, you know, first of all, it's not pleasurable, but um, that's what's going to prevent you from living a long life and enjoying these simple pleasures. So Epicurus would try to like get everything working well, uh, make everything a well-oiled system, uh, you know, sand off the sharp edges, make everything roll and work together, make personalities get along together and not clash and jive and um, fight. And so Epicurus was actually a really good philosopher for building up a nice interactive organic society. And a lot of Epicurus's philosophy, a lot of people were attracted to Epicureanism. In, he was often teaching in um, Egypt, in Alexandria, down here in, you know, the northwest corner of Egypt. And all throughout Egypt, start, there started popping up these houses where they would live together and live the Epicurean philosophy of simple pleasures. And they were called communes, Ep the Epicurean communes. And they, there were several of them up and, here, up and down the Nile. And as more and more people saw, came to, they, they would come to these communities and see, hey, these people have it pretty nice. They have libraries. They have um, every, a nice division of work. So they have a good social life. And they, um, everyone does their little part. And, you know, people get along. And um, these communes took the ancient world by fire. There were hundreds of them. And, you know, maybe even thousands of them scattered throughout the ancient world. And they went on, some people say that they went on existing right into the time of Christianity, at which time many of them just flipped over and became monasteries. So in some ways you could see Epicurus as the start of, the, of Christian monasticism in many ways. Of course, you had to wait for Christianity to come along and preach belief in an afterlife and say, no, it's not just a pile of atoms, like Epicurus had said. But still, the, the practic, the, um, the, philo the practical philosophy was the same. So, um, well, uh, some people were, thought they were wiser than Epicurus and said, hey, you say it's the simple pleasures in life? Well, guess what? Hey, we can indulge in those simple pleasures, and we can indulge in them even a lot more. So over next to Egypt here was this next region here called Cyrene. If you ever um, recall in the Bible, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a Cy Cyrenaean, I think, a Cyrenian. Um, this is like the northern coast of Libya, and the Cyrenaic school um, preached full throttle um, hedonism, which is from the Greek word hedos, pleasure, full indulgence in pleasure. And so they would go full at it, orgies, lust, sex, gluttony, any of this, you know, basically seven deadly sins that suits you, Go for it, they would say. And so this this was called the Cyrenaic School, and they had their similar little communes, but they were much more um, full of upset as people um, just went all at it, raced to the bottom, um, raw pleasure indulgence. 
And so we, we can, you can actually hear um, perhaps, perhaps this is a suggestion to this in the Odyssey in Book 9. Um, you can pause the video and read this. But Odysseus says that his crew got captured in this very same region of Cyrene. Well, he says it's Libya, which is over here, but Libya... But it's, the story is that it was right after he crossed this cape here, of, um, which would be closer to Cyrene, um, the Cape of Malia, that he was swept away by a storm and they landed on the African coast and the lotus eaters here um, seduced his crew and he had to whip them and force them back onto their boats, otherwise they would have, he would have just lost them all to their indulgence in the, um, in the Cyrenaic school-like um, of philosophy, well, philosophy of life that was common there. All right, so there you have it. Those are the four basic schools that emerged, the four philosophies of the ancient world that emerged out of the big three. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Um, of course, Platonism and Aristotelianism themselves continued. The Aristotelians, Platonism became called Neoplatonism and got adapted into Christianity through St. Augustine. And Aristotle, Aristotelianism came to be called Peripateticism. Peripatetic means peri, around pateo, walking, because they would always pace around their um, little school there, their schools, while they were discussing ideas. Oh yeah, and I forgot to go through the two, the schools of Plato and Aristotle. So Plato in um, Athens founded a school called the um, Academy, and Plato was a citizen, so he actually owned the Academy. But Aristotle down here wasn't a citizen, so he had to meet in the public place called the Lyceum. So Aristotle's school was called the Lyceum, and they would in Aristotle's school they would it was basically a colonnade, like kind of like a palaestra, um, a four-sided colonnade around an open garden, and they would discuss things as they paced around this colonnade, and so that's why Aristotelians call, call, came to be called peripatetics, who they would talk while walking. Um, so, okay, so th that's basically the philosophies of the ancient world. You have four um, schools that emerge from them, plus just plain out of the straight Platonism, Aristotelianism, and then a spice of a few other things like the Cyrenaic school. But Cyrenaic school quickly destroyed itself just because it was so um, indulgent. So really, it's just the four schools um, that were left over. All right. Hope you enjoyed the video and now you can answer the questions.